All right, guys, to answer some of the questions that we've had from our subscribers, by the way, you can subscribe to these videos if you want to kind of stay updated with what we're putting out. We're trying to put out a lot more content for you guys. Uh, we've noticed that people have questions and because we do motor scooters and motorcycles, everything from 50 cc's up to 2300 cc's, we've got a lot of stuff in between information we can give you. Today, what we're gonna talk about is buying your very first scooter. And we kind of had a look around on the internet and nobody really has addressed this. And it's hard to get good information from somebody who isn't just trying to sell you that particular scooter that they're selling. So if you go on the internet, one might be led to believe that for $999, you can get a perfectly adequate brand new scooter. And what we can tell you is after 18 years in the business, that is simply not true. So here are some options you're gonna be faced with when you're thinking about going out into the world and getting a scooter, entering this world of two-wheeled motorized transportation. The first thing, we are not even going to acknowledge 49 cc's in this video. The reason we're going to avoid them is for most applications, a 49 cc scooter is going to have a top speed of around 32 miles per hour and it is not going to have the power that you will need outside of something like a, an island, a, you know, touring around on Putin Bay or touring around uh, Key West that's great or maybe you're going to rent a scooter to just see las vegas those things are places where a 30 mile per hour vehicle are going to work out well for you but if you're actually talking about using this to commute back and forth to work and you're going to be going on streets that have speed limits of 35 miles per hour or higher you're not going to be happy with a 49 cc bike and that's our you know we call them 49 cc's because the term of art is 50 cc so Everything we're gonna talk about today is gonna to be 125 cc's or bigger. That's sort of the cutoff point in between. And we're gonna talk about some different things that you may discover when you enter into the world of trying to buy your first scooter. And you're gonna get different stories from different people. We're gonna to try to cover as many of those as we can right now here today. On the far left over here, what we've got is what everyone's gonna come across when we start the quest. Everyone starts the quest, and believe me, we've been hearing about this for many, many years, is I want a bike for less than 500 bucks, or I want a bike for around $500, because you've never had one before, and you're not willing to make that huge of a commitment into something you're not certain whether or not you're going to like. And here's what we can tell you. When you are in that $500 price point, it's very dangerous. The likelihood of you getting something good or you getting something that you're gonna be happy with for $500 is extremely rare, very challenging. So here's what we're gonna show you. You're gonna see a lot of stuff like this. The bike on the outside is a Chinese, it's an off-brand. By off-brand, what I'm saying is it's not a Vespa, it's not a Piaggio, it's not a Kimco, it's not a Honda, it's not a Suzuki, a Kawasaki, a Yamaha, or a BMW. It's an off-brand. You have to be careful with this kind of thing because even though this particular bike was imported by a company, a U.S. company, uh, years ago called TNG, and they did a really good job of trying to support their product and getting parts in and having a dealer network, they were, I heard somebody use the phrase, they were the best of the worst. And that's actually not an inaccurate description. They did everything they could, everything in their power to support their products. However, here we are 10 years later, 12 years later, you can't get parts for that bike. And when you're talking about any of the Chinese bikes, when you're looking at a Roketa and you're looking at, uh, God forbid, a Wildfire, when you're looking at these kinds of things, a Vento, the market was flooded with these things around 2006 and they were everywhere delivered to your home in a box and Tao Tao and a lot of the stuff that even is still sold today. The challenge is, one, it wasn't built to be kept. It wasn't built to be enjoyed. It wasn't built to be ridden. It was built to be bought. It was built to be sold. And there was no support beyond that. And if you did have a bad experience, even when they were brand new and they were offering you a 90 day or a 180 day warranty, even if that was the case, if you did have a catastrophic failure, how did you get your money back? Did you mail it back to China and get your money back from China? Or did you go back to Swap Meet Louis, the guy you bought it from? Well, he's gone now, he's closed up shop. He's not at the you know, trailer park anymore. So you're basically out in the cold on these things. And right now, parts support on these bikes is so despicable that we're telling people don't even bring them in. We don't even wanna look at them. 
and you actually get parts for these bikes by looking at pictures on the internet and saying, oh, my bike looks like that one, okay? And you're gonna hear a lot of stuff about the words GY6, and just ignore that. Anytime somebody's talking about, oh, it's a GY6 motor. No, dude, it is not a GY6 motor. It's not related to a GY6 motor. That's a term that people trying to sell you one will use to suggest to you that this bike is easy to support or uh, parts are still available for it because you know it's got a GY6 motor just like all of them. So you just need you know this crank or this cylinder. It would be better if you're going to spend $500 to put that $500 towards something else. If you purchase something like a Honda Elite 80, you'll be able to buy the same amount of bike for that dollar. And maybe you have to throw another $100 on top of that. But by buying something like a Honda Elite 80 or maybe a older Yamaha Vino 125, there are still parts for those. Because Honda and Yamaha distributed those in the United States, you can still get parts for those bikes and keep them on the road. Uh, we do like the Honda Elite 80. It's a very, very good bike to get parts for. And despite it only being 80 cc's, it will be faster than any of these Chinese 125s or 150s. Because even though it may say you're going 60 miles per hour on the speedometer, that's probably only about 45 miles per hour in the real world. So getting an Elite 80 is a much better idea and get the newest one you can buy. So in the case of those four stroke 80 cc Honda bikes and the uh, Yamaha Vino 125s, which were also manufactured in China, but they're very high quality for that price point. I'd much rather see you spending that money. So the other thing that you're going to think about buying is going to be actual vintage. So actual vintage, you could, if you're looking around, you say, you know, I want a real bike. I want a real vintage scooter. I don't want a replica. I don't want today's modern version. I'm old school, baby. I want to kick it old school and I'm going to learn how to be a mechanic and I'm going to do all my own work. And how hard could it be? You are going down a hole of despair. Uh, do not buy a vintage bike until you have another bike that you can get to work on reliably. Using a vintage scooter to be reliable transportation is going to cause you problems. The operating systems on old Vespas and old Lambrettas are all cable based. They have a cable clutch, cable shifters, a cable throttle, cable front brake, cable back brakes, even a cable choke. Everything on this bike is cable operated. And if you think your 27 speed mountain bike has a lot of cables on it, you have not met one of these things yet. And remember, it's a 40 or 50 or 60 year old operating system. And maintenance will be the key to keeping one of these bikes on the road. And even that being said, if you spend 12 or $1,500 and find yourself a barn find or a project bike that you think you're gonna be putting back on the road, Keep in mind the $3,000 rule. And that is, if you buy it for 500, be prepared to put 2,500 into it. If you buy it for 2,000, be prepared to put 1,000 into it. Your end purchase price will be around $3,000. And that's a guy that buys and sells these things for a living telling you that. If you're coming at it saying you think you're gonna buy a bike for $1,200 that's going to be ready to go, just because it says in the Craigslist listing, it runs great. Now that means it runs great at the moment. What probably is gonna happen is the fly side seal is gonna break down. If a bike hasn't been run for a long time, all the rubber bits inside of it dry out and they will run for an hour or so and then everything will fail all at one time. And you may find it yourself on the side of the road needing a complete motor rebuild, which is gonna cost you $1,000 in today's money for a vintage bike. So be very careful of that. Do not purchase a vintage scooter until you have other running transportation. This is a hobby thing. This is not your daily driver. It can be, but you're going to have to do a lot of studying. You're gonna to have to do a lot of learning. You're gonna to have to know the way these work before you can just dive in with this as being your first bike. And don't get me wrong, we know they're attractive. We hear about it every day. That also falls in with all of the after stuff. So the Bajaj, the Bajaj Cheetah and Bajaj Legend that were out in 2002, four-stroke. Be careful of those. It is incredibly hard to find parts for those bikes right now. 
before you purchase anything, make sure that what you're buying has parts available for it. It is easier to get parts for a 1964 Vespa than it is for a 2002 Bajaj. And then you get into the newest stuff, which would be like your Stella four-stroke automatics. Those bikes had problems when they came out of the box. That is not an easy bike to keep on the road. So do your research, get on forums, ask around, find out what people who are riding them are going through. But if you're thinking about going vintage for your first bike, take a tip from a Yonky Phil. That is going to be a real commitment. I mean, it's going to it's going to be hard on you. Now, the next thing would be getting a Vespa, but not a vintage Vespa and not a brand new Vespa because a brand new Vespa is going to run you about five large for a 150. Whereas a vintage Vespa is going to have tons and tons of stuff in between. Where are the other Goldilocks conundrum here? Uh, let's go in the middle. Let's go just right. So that's where we are here. This would be they started importing these into America right around 2000. This is the Vespa ET4. It's a 150 cc. It's an automatic. It has hydraulic disc brake in the front. Uh, it's press the button, go ride the bike. You do have to kind of keep an eye on the carburetors on these. You're going to have to do a little bit of, if you live in an area where you can't ride them year round, you're going to want to watch your fuel stabilizer. You're gonna to have to keep your battery charged. These bikes do not like running around on a dead battery. They do have electric start, which is great. And you can use this bike every single day. And the parts for this bike are still available. Good thing for you, if you're looking at something like this, you'll probably be able to buy this bike for under $2,000 and have the real Vespa experience. Uh, I've seen models like this go for 60, 70,000 miles. So this is a good bike. It's robust, it's very durable, and it has excellent quality components. When you get into one of these bikes, you are making a little bit of a smarter decision because you're getting something that was built to be supported and there's already a complete support network for it. This is a much smarter use of your money than going vintage or God forbid, going uh, unsupportable Chinese. Now, also an option for the new or the new scooterist is buying a new bike. And that doesn't have to cost you the five large we were talking about for a brand new Vespa Primavera. There are other brands out in the market that are affordable yet have lots of quality behind them and a lot of quality built into them. So to our far right over here, we have the Kimco Like 150. Now, the reason we bring this bike up as an example is because this is a bike that is about $25.99 for a brand new bike with a two year warranty. It has anti-lock brakes, it has 12 inch wheels, it has fuel injection, and they've even got a version coming out that's Bluetooth compatible so you can do all of your Instagramming and Facebooking and Snapchatting and stuff while you're going down the road at 50 miles an hour. I hope not, but it does that. It talks to your phone and your phone talks to the bike. There's really good underseat storage with these bikes. They're press button go ride bikes. We've had them now for a little shy of a year. And we found them to be a really good, a very reliable, and extremely well-built bike, aside from the fact that it's made in China. And we're going to have to start changing our view on that around here. Um, we kind of went into this with cautious optimism, and it turns out it's been good. It's been a really good bike. The people we sold them to are very, very happy with them. Because it is from a company like Kimco, it will be very, very easy to get parts for it. Kimco's been around for a very, very long time. They're a Taiwan-based company, and these particular bikes are made in China. They have products that are made in China and made in Taiwan as well. Kimco also is responsible for building a lot of the BMW product that you can buy today. So big companies, and Honda did for years, big companies that have money to spend and customers to keep satisfied have historically used Kimco to get a good quality product at a very, very low price point. That's a decent option for somebody who's looking at their very first bike. And we do understand around here that you probably do want to have a Vespa. You're probably leaning in that direction where I want a Vespa. Of course you do. But it may not be the right choice for you for bike number one. So these things going this direction Hopefully we've covered the different directions that people are going to pull you or advice that people are going to give you. Keep in mind, if you're planning on owning the bike for two or three years while you decide whether or not riding a scooter is right for you, the biggest thing about choosing your first scooter and getting into riding a two-wheeled vehicle is actually not the bike, it's actually you. It's the way that you respond to the traffic situations around you. 
Your whole world will change when you get out of your car and get on two wheels. It is an excellent idea to start with something that has an automatic transmission and good brakes because the transition from going from your car to a two-wheeled vehicle is going to surprise you. The way that people around you may not notice that you're there, the way that you may decide to take options in traffic you couldn't take with your car, having the automatic, always being in the right gear, having good brakes that you can rely on and excellent visibility are really important things. And that's why going with a Chinese product or a vintage product that may not have the acceleration, it may be in the wrong gear with the vintage bike, or the brakes may not be up to the standard. And we can tell you with a lot of the Chinese brake bikes, we've gone out and from 45 miles an hour grabbed those brakes and the bike takes forever to stop. It's just as bad as one of these old vintage bikes where they didn't even have disc brakes. They were just a cable operated drum brake. So the safety margin is much higher on something that was built in this century. And keep that in mind. Remember that safety is your primary concern. Looking cool is great, but you're going to look a lot cooler when you're riding by as opposed to being on the back of that tow truck or in the ambulance. Nobody ever looks cool then. So when we look at this kind of thing, keep that in mind, especially if it's your first bike. When we look at these kinds of things over here, the other thing to look at is really, really go over the bike. You're looking at a bike that could be 18, 19 years old in this case. Really go over the thing carefully. Make sure it's been well maintained. If you want and you have a motorcycle shop near you, and you're really heart set on getting this bike and you're about to make a $2,000 purchase, wouldn't it be cool to go into a motorcycle shop, spend maybe 70 or 80 bucks and have them look the bike over? Let pay their mechanic, good money, pay them to look at that bike because they may find things on that bike that you wouldn't notice. And that could save you $2,000. They may notice that the bike has a problem or maybe the bike needs a massive service that's gonna very quickly add $1,000 to your purchase price. Always keep in mind, there's a reason that person's selling that bike. And that's your job as a buyer to be a little bit of a detective and find out why it's being sold before you sign the deed or sign the title and take ownership of it and now you're responsible for everything with it. Being a smart consumer is really going to pay off when you buy your very first scooter. If you need more support or if you have questions, you can go into the comments section of this video and go ahead and blast them on there. You'll find that I do respond to the comments that go down there. We can help you. We can give you some tips and tricks for looking at scooters and kind of getting to know them and entering into the scooter market. We have not talked about 300cc bikes. We haven't talked about freeway flyers. We're just talking about truly the entry level here. That's what this is. We will have other videos to come talking about the bigger bikes, talking about other things you might want to go into in your first one. All these bikes are not intended to be used on the freeway a lot. You can get on, go and exit or two, check your state laws, your mileage may vary, etc. This is mostly for the entry level stuff. I hope you guys had a good time. I hope you learned something. Remember, please ride fast and take chances.